Good morning. Somebody made a comment as I was coming in just a few minutes ago, said, boy, this is like old times. Listen to all the talk inside the sanctuary there. <clears throat> Everybody fellowshipping and visiting. It's good to be here, is it not? Yes. To be gathered to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a glorious day. What a wonderful opportunity to worship and serve him. Take the t opportunity to read the, uh, your bulletin, the various announcements that are there. If you're uh, parents with preschool children or, or school-age children and you have not filled out the uh, little, we're trying to get feedback information from you, please fill that out and turn it in when you uh, uh, fill out the attendance registration. Put it in the offering plate. Take note of the fact that now is the season of time when we are uh, receiving uh, gifts toward the, our associational missions offering. And um, there's a prayer guide in there, and it shares with you some of the ministries that are funded from this offering, uh, various local ministries in Central Virginia. And uh, we have an opportunity to share and to participate in those. Are there any other announcements? The deacons are meeting following the worship service this morning. So if you are a, a, a deacon, an active deacon, we uh, encourage you to stay for that, uh, that, that meeting. And yes. Everybody, if they're interested in the CPR course, to let me know. OK. Uh, for, for, for you he, uh, gathered here and for those who are outside, Sandra just said, if you are interested in taking a CPR course renewal or even first time, correct, to see her as they are in the, she's in the process of rescheduling that. Ten people? Yes. Ten people. So the first ten. First ten. And I've got not, not eleven. Not eleven, not twelve. Only ten. Only ten. Okay, there you go. So people will, there'll be a maddening rush to you following the, uh, the service because when you know, if, if, if you said open to anybody, nobody would have showed up. But when you say first 10, yeah. <laughs> that'll make a difference. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, how good it is to be gathered here this morning to worship you, the one from whom all blessings flow. Lord, we acknowledge your greatness this morning. We acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your mercy and your grace, your abundant love for us, O oh Lord. Thank you for being there with us. Thank you for being there for us, that, that you are a God who walks alongside of us and that you share life with us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us to desire to know you more and more, to love you deeper, and to follow you, Lord, with a commitment that is in line with our love for thee. Thank you, O Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is... Uh, more about Jesus. The words are printed in the bulletin, and for those of you gathered in the sanctuary, I invite you to stand as we sing this hymn together this morning.
Be seated, please. Our scripture reading today is taken from Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, beginning with verse 13. We are continuing in the Christian season of Easter and uh, looking at the Lord's post-resurrection appearances to his various disciples. And so we come here to this familiar passage in Luke 24, beginning with verse 13. And we'll be reading through verse 36. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further. But they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were saying this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace. Be unto you. This is the word of God. May we hear it and believe it and be thankful for it. Well, Luke, the gospel writer, gives us an opportunity to participate in a tremendous occasion here. He allows us to join two disciples on the road to Emmaus. When Jesus, Jesus himself, appears to them and joins them. 
And through what Luke here is sharing, we have the opportunity to join them and to share in that experience. These two disciples are traveling to Emmaus, which was about seven miles west of Jerusalem. They were talking about things that had happened. Now, what exactly was it that they were talking about? Well, in verses 19 through 20, they share basically the content of their discussion. They were talking about Jesus. They were talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. Without realizing it, they were talking about the gospel. They were sharing the gospel message, a rehearsal, if you will, for what they would be doing the rest of their lives, talking about Jesus. We talk about a lot of things in life, don't we? Oh boy, do we. We talk about a lot of things. But do we talk about Jesus? Do we talk about Jesus? I've shared with you many times through the years how we have no difficulty talking about the things we love. You talk to a grandparent, and it doesn't take them too long to start talking about the grandchildren. Or you talk to a sports fanatic, and it's not too long before they're ready, eager, and willing to talk about their sports team. We talk about the things we love. Some people have no difficulty talking about the latest gossip. So we don't have problems talking, do we? Why can't we talk about Jesus? Why can't we talk about the gospel? Why can't we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ? Years ago, I was making a hospital visit, and it was a, a hospital visit of a serious nature. The individual had a terminal illness, and the family was there gathered. And we sat around talking, passing the time, and I would try as best I could to somehow, because of the seriousness of the situation, to talk about eternal things, to talk about God, to talk about Jesus would somehow just try to take a cue from how the conversation was going and to talk about God's goodness, and God's mercy, and God's presence with us in all situations and circumstances. Afterwards, the father and the husband communicated to me a comment that one of his daughters made. She said, you know one of the things I like about Ed and, you know, that perked my ears when I, when, when I said that. You know, one of the things I like about Ed, he talks about Jesus so naturally that you don't even realize it. You know, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to talk about Jesus so naturally so naturally that people hear it, that people hear it. We can talk about so many things. Let's talk about Jesus. That's what these, these people were doing. They were talking about Jesus along the road. In verse 15, it says, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. There's a sense in which, to me, this verse pretty much sums up the Christian experience. In Jesus, God draws near to us. God walks alongside of us. God is with us. Amen? Amen. Jesus draws near to us. He is a loving, living, lingering presence in our lives. If you have had any life experiences, 
as a Christian or as a Christ follower, you can attest how Jesus has drawn near to you in your time of need. I know because you've told me. I can look at any number of folks out here. John talking about time of witnessing, time of sharing. I can look at any number of people out here, and there have been times when you have shared with me how the Lord Jesus has walked alongside of you. You know what I'm telling you is the truth. You know what this account is saying and sharing is the truth because you yourselves have experienced it. Now, there's a very interesting verse here in verse 16. It says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I think we all experience times in our lives when Jesus seems to be distant or not present. Notice I said the word seems, okay? I think all of us have experienced those times. I think of a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow that I remember in school, an epic poem. That means it was really long. Um, <laughs> Evangeline was the name of this poem. And it's a story of uh, a French-Canadian woman who is separated from her fiance due to resettlement by political forces that come in and basically resettle the, uh, the French Canadian people. During this resettlement, she is separated from her beloved, her fiance. And the poem spends most of the time talking about the rest of her life seeking to be reunited with her beloved. It's a real sad poem. It's a real downer, I'll tell you. And there's one point where Evangeline, in speaking of her beloved, and apparently had become very close to connecting, their paths almost crossed. She says, art thou so near me that I cannot behold thee? Art thou so near me, and yet thy voice does not reach me? And I always, whenever I read that, I always thought of how poignant those words were. And, and I always read that, and when I read those words, I thought of people who are searching for God. So close sometimes, but unable to connect. Art thou so near me, and yet I cannot behold thee. Art thou so near me, and yet thy voice does not reach me. We know that there are times in our lives when it seems that God is distant. Fleming Rutledge says here, recognition was we withheld from them until the moment God chose. I've read a lot of scholars and a lot of commentators who, in talking about this, this verse, saying that, that they did not recognize him, their eyes were kept from recognizing him, that they said, oh, well, they were walking westward as the sun was setting, and no doubt they were probably blinded by the setting sun. Or, or they, were talk, they would talk about the fact that, that, that people many times are blinded by grief. And that's true. That's true. Many times we can be blinded by grief. But the scripture here says they were kept. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. You see, God reveals God's self to us. Not necessarily when we want but according to his will and his perfect timing and according to our need. And in the meantime, we live by faith. I've shared with you many times the story of the young Jewish girl during World War II as the Nazis were taking over Warsaw and how she escaped the Nazis and she hid in a cave. 
She died in that cave shortly before the Allied army came to liberate. But before her death, she had scratched three things on that wall. These are three things you ought to remember. These are three things you ought to commit to memory. She said, first, I believe in the sun, even though it's not shining. Second, I believe in love, even when feeling it not. And then third, I believe in God even when he's silent. Faith. That's faith. And there are times in life when we live with silence. There are times in life when we live with God's silence. Earlier this year, I had a lot of questions for God that I wanted answers for. And the answers were not forthcoming. And I went to God, taking issue with God on it. He's like, God, hello? I want some answers. I need you. And I remember the account of this young woman. God will answer in his way and in his timing. And I will put my faith in God. I will have faith in him. Faith in him. You see, and that's where these people were. That's where these two disciples were. Because as far as they were concerned, their world had fallen apart because Jesus had become their world. In verses 25 through 27, Jesus interprets for them the scriptures and how the scriptures are fulfilled in him. And I think that speaks to us. Because to each and every one of us, Jesus draws near and he listens to us and he doesn't leave us in the dark. Amen? Amen. He doesn't leave us in the dark. He comes to us in the dark. He comes to us in the dark moments of life. But when he comes to us, he doesn't leave us in the dark. He sheds light upon the path. He enlightens us. He reveals his truth to us through his word. Jerry Hayner has said, God meets us in the pages of his word like a friend speaking to a friend. Did you hear that? God meets us in the pages of his word like a friend speaking to a friend. How many times have you found comfort or strength or peace simply by reading the word of God? How many times have you found comfort and strength and peace? Because a verse that you memorized as a sunbeam, some of y'all know what a sunbeam is. Or as a mission friend. Or in a Sunday school class when you were a preschooler. How many times does one of those verses that you memorized as a child come to mind? And it gives you strength. And it gives you courage. And it gives you peace. And let me tell you something. That isn't coincidence. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit enlightening you. And leading you and speaking to you. Verse 28 tells us that they draw close to their final destination. And it says of Jesus, he appeared to be going further. Jesus is always going further. Jesus is always going further. And yet, he doesn't leave us behind. He's always going further. 
His plans are greater than our plans. His vision is greater than our vision. Our tasks so often are so trivial, but his tasks are monumental and eternal. He's always going further, but he does not leave us behind. He carries us with him in his presence and strength. We join him on his eternal mission. He goes before us preparing the way, preparing us to join him. There is no place we can go that Jesus has not already been there or is there. I think it's Billy Graham's daughter who made this statement. Fear not tomorrow. God is already there. Fear not tomorrow. God is already there because Jesus goes before us. In verse 29, they invited Jesus to stay with them. Jesus never turns down an invitation to fellowship with him. To every person who has opened their heart and their life to him, he comes. There's a wonderful promise in Revelation 3.20. You all know it. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus never turns down an invitation. He stands at the door ready and willing to become a part of your life if you'll let him in. In verse 30, he sits at the table with them to eat. And he takes bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it. Something that he had done countless of times with his disciples. And verse 31 says, upon seeing him, Break the bread and bless it. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. Now, in this moment, in the moment of God's choosing, recognition takes place. Recognition. Spiritual, Christian enlightenment. It eventually comes to those who stay the course and remain faithful. Over 40 years ago, I did something really, really crazy. I quit my job, had a good job, I left my career, and I entered seminary to prepare myself for the gospel ministry, to fulfill my calling in Christ, to become trained, to become equipped. Now, I'm going to tell you something I've probably never told anybody else before. I felt so out of place in seminary, because you see, when I went to college, I majored in business. I dealt with numbers. We did case studies, we did projects. The entire four years I was in college, I never wrote a paper because I was a business major. We didn't deal with words, we dealt with numbers. And then I worked for a utility corporation but in seminary, I was like a fish out of water. And I had to write papers. Judy would tell you I'm still learning. Uh, but <laughs> I 
Many times in classes, the professors would say something. And it must have been profound what they said. Because I'd look around and everybody else in class would be doing, you know. And I had no idea what the professor had said. I had no clue. I had to learn a new way of listening. And I had to learn a new way of expressing myself. I guess what I'm saying is that learning and education and enlightenment doesn't always come on like switching on a light. Okay? Years later, through an experience that I have, a living encounter in life, or through reading a book, I will have an aha experience. Does that ever happen to you? I'll have an aha experience. And it's like, all of a sudden, it becomes clear to me. And I'll say something like, so that is what Dr. Eddins was saying way back when in that classroom. That's why everybody was sitting around nodding at that profound statement. Forty years later, and I finally get it. I'm just glad that after 40 years, I still have moments of enlightenment. Thank God. Thank God. I share that, I share that with you, because Jesus, you know, Jesus had talked to these disciples throughout his ministry. Jesus, Jesus had, had talked to them about the scriptures. Jesus had talked to them about, about what was going to happen to him. You know, the scriptures tell us that at least three times in his ministry, Jesus told them what was going to happen in Jerusalem, right? Right? And they didn't get it. But eventually they did. If there's hope for them, there's hope for us. Amen? Amen. And I hope until the day I die, and I hope until the day you die, you will continue to have experiences of enlightenment. When the Lord walks up along beside of you and walks with you along the way. And says, here is the way. Walk in it. Jesus comes to us in moments of darkness, but he doesn't leave us in the dark. Amen. Amen. When you walk in the Lord, whether it's on the road to Emmaus, or whether it's on a road in King William County, he still comes to us. He still reveals himself to us. He still enlightens us with his truth. He still comforts us with his peace. And when that happens, when that happens, our hearts burn inside of us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Lord, thank you for having much to do with us. Thank you, Lord, that you come to each and every one of us in our time of need. 
because you are our living, resurrected Lord. There are no limitations upon what you can and will do. And Lord, how thankful we are that you can and will come to us even now during our times of need. Lord, there are times when we feel alone. We feel alone, but we're not alone. Because, Lord, we know by faith and we know because of your word that you are with us and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Lord, during those times when there's silence, during those times, Lord, when it's difficult for us to see, increase our faith. Help us to walk with you and to know that you are there with us and beside us. Oh Lord, praise be to you for your wonderful, living, loving presence available to each and every one of us through Christ Jesus, our living and resurrected Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. This day, our hymn <coughs> is trust and obey when we walk with the Lord. When we walk with the Lord. Are you walking with the Lord? Would you like to walk with the Lord? Would you like to experience a new life, new life in Christ that comes from knowing him personally, from inviting him into your life? And as we said earlier, if you invite Jesus into your life, he will not hesitate. He will come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, we invite you to make that decision today. Make that decision today. During the singing of this hymn, come forward and say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And we'll talk about that. Maybe you're a Christian, but you want to rededicate, recommit your life to him. To be renewed in the faith. Even as no doubt these disciples were renewed in the faith in their experience of the living Lord. We invite you to rededicate, recommit your life. And if you're looking for a church home, a church family, because, you know, all of us as Christians need a home, a place to belong. And if you feel like that this is the place where God is leading you, then we invite you to come forward to say, you know, I'm a believer and I'm a member of a, another church, but you know what? I feel like this is where God wants me to be. Then we invite you to come and become a part of our family of faith as we do life together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Our hymn is Trust and Obey. Will you come as we sing this hymn? Let us stand as we sing.
Please be seated. This being the first Sunday of the month, as is our custom, we gather together to share in the Lord's Supper. I hope you have received uh, the uh, uh, combined bread and cup from uh, the deacon as you uh, came in this morning. The disciples on the road to Emmaus recognized Jesus when he took bread and broke it and blessed it. He is present with us here this day as we gather together to partake of this bread and of this cup. Paul writes of the Lord's Supper. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Let us give thanks. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we come now, partaking of this meal, O oh Lord, that, that you instituted, that you said, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we come here this day partaking of this bread and the cup in order to remember you. We remember, O oh Lord, the giving of your life. As we partake of this bread, we are reminded, O oh Lord, that your, your body was given on that cross on our behalf your blood was shed in order that we might experience the forgiveness of sin and the promise and the hope and the assurance of eternal life with you. And so, Lord, we are thankful for that. And, Lord, we are also reminded that, that you died for us for the sake of our sin. We come here, Lord, sharing in this meal, acknowledging that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And the good news is that Jesus saves. Thank you for that, O oh Lord. And help us that that might be a sharp reminder to us this day. In thy name we pray. Amen. It says here, Paul says that Jesus said, took the bread and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite you to tear off that initial covering. And there's a wafer. Jesus said, this bread represents my body given for you. Take, eat ye all of it in remembrance of me, and be thankful. O oh Lord, we come now to partake of this cup, reminding, O oh Lord, that your precious blood was shed that we might have life eternal. O oh Lord, Help us as your followers that we might live sacrificial lives pleasing unto you. And that, Lord, we might be willing to go where you lead us, to follow where you direct, to serve where you call. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to peel off the uh, covering for the juice. As we recall Jesus' words, Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. A new covenant, meaning a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. He says, Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. And be thankful. O oh Lord, our
As we have shared in the taking of this bread and the drinking of this cup, we remember you. We remember, O oh Lord, what you have done for us. We remember, O oh Lord, the promises that you have given to us. We remember, O oh Lord, your life. We remember, O oh Lord, your death. We remember your resurrection. And we remember that you are a living presence with us every single day and every single moment of our lives. O oh Lord, help us to live simply, to love gently, to care deeply, to speak kindly, to pray daily, and leave the rest to you, our wonderful God. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we sing our parting hymn. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love.